I forget why the guy shoot you nine times. Was it drugs or something? He was paid to do it. He was paid to do it. Yeah. 50 came over my house. He met me at the apartment uh, because I overheard the conversation about these guys wanted them dead. So he asked me, did I have a vest? I said, yeah, I got, I got a bulletproof vest. So now, long story short, I told 50 he was going to be good when he come out there because I was going to bodyguard him. On May 24, 2000, 50 Cent was hit with one of the most brutal moments of his life. He was shot nine times in a drive-by shooting right outside his grandmother's house in South Jamaica, Queens, New York. The attack was intense. Someone rolled up on him and just started blasting, hitting him in his hand, arm, hip, legs, chest, and even his face. I knew I was about to die. I don't know why I was expecting my father to rescue me. I realized I've been looking for him all my life. He was rushed to the hospital in critical condition and had to go through multiple surgeries just to stay alive. That incident shook everyone, especially considering 50's rising fame at the time. People couldn't believe that someone so successful could be the target of such a violent attack. For 50, this moment became a huge turning point in his life. He's talked about how getting shot made him rethink everything, and how lucky he felt to still be alive. He realized that he had been given a second chance, and he needed to make the most of it. The exact reasons behind the shooting have always been kind of murky, with lots of rumors and theories floating around. Some people think it was connected to 50's past involvement in the drug trade, while others believe it might have stemmed from personal beef. Whatever the case, no one was really sure who was behind the attempt on his life until now as a new twist has emerged. I forget why the guy shoot you nine times? Was it drugs or something? He was paid to do it. He was paid to do it. Yeah. Enter Gene Deal. Diddy's former bodyguard who's been stirring the pot with some interesting claims. Gene Deal has recently come forward with a new perspective on the shooting, one that's making people question everything. According to Deal, 50 Cent might have actually survived that day because of a bulletproof vest he had given to him. I overheard the conversation about these guys wanted him dead. So he asked me, did I have a vest? I said, yeah, I got, I got a bulletproof vest. If what he says is true, then 50 might have lost his life if it wasn't for that vest. But the story doesn't stop there. Deal's revelations have people wondering if Diddy had some kind of involvement in the shooting, especially considering Deal's deep insider knowledge of what was happening behind the scenes at the time. Gene Deal's credibility comes from the fact that he was right there during some major events, including the night Biggie was emdred. He's said before that he warned Diddy to beef up security that night because he sensed something was going to go down, but Diddy apparently ignored his advice. They should have had better security. I asked them before we, okay, we gonna go out? Let's hire some more security. They refuse to hire more security. We all know how that tragic night turned out, and for years there's been speculation that Diddy might have had something to do with Biggie's death. Now, with these new revelations from Gene Deal, people are starting to wonder if 50 Cent's attempted emder could somehow be tied into the long list of rumored deaths that Diddy's been associated with. So could Diddy have had some kind of hand in the attempt on 50 Cent's life? Let's dive in deeper. So recently, Gene Deal sat down for an interview and really spilled the tea about the whole 50 Cent incident, giving everyone more insight into what went down back in the day. He shared a story about how 50 came over to his apartment because Gene had overheard a conversation that some guys were plotting to go after 50. Apparently 50 asked if Gene had a bulletproof vest, and luckily Gene did. He used to buy extra vests from officers. These guys wanted him dead. So he asked me did I have a vest. I said yeah I got, I got a bulletproof vest. So I had some extra vests because I used to buy them from officers and stuff like that. However, when 50 tried it on, it was too big for him. So Gene ended up giving him a smaller cover to fit the vest that 50 already had. Gene went on to warn 50 that the guys were going to come for him, but 50 was all about handling his business. Before anything happened though, 50 had plans to head out to Cancun to shoot the video for How to Rob. He had already been given some upfront money for it, something like $5,000. Gene reassured 50 that he'd be good while in Cancun because Gene had connections there with some guys who worked with the syndicate. He'd been going out to Cancun regularly and doing security at Daddy O's, so he had everything lined up to protect 50 while he was there. 50 then told me he was going to handle his business, but he had to go out to Cancun. I told him we good out at Cancun because I had met some guys who worked with the syndicate. But things took a turn. Gene said he tried reaching 50 when he was supposed to be in Cancun, but 50 never showed up. 
Then, while Gene was walking through a hotel, he ran into 50's manager, who told him that 50 had been shot and was in ICU, fighting for his life. The manager was surprisingly calm about it, which annoyed Gene. He couldn't understand why this guy was lounging by the pool when 50 was in critical condition. So I'm calling 50, he never, because he, he didn't show up. I'm walking through the hotel, and his manager, he said, I need to speak to Chad. I said, well, what's, what's up? He said, uh, 50 shot. He's in ICU. After hearing the news, Gene immediately got a phone card to try to reach 50. After a few calls, a girl finally answered 50's phone, and she told Gene that 50 was going to make it and that she'd pass along his message. The next time Gene saw 50 was sometime after the shooting, at the It's Your Birthday event in Puerto Rico during Jack the Rapper. At that point, 50 wasn't speaking to a lot of people, but when he spotted Gene, he came straight over to him, dapped him up and said, they can't stop what God's got planned, before walking off. He came directly over to me. He said, yo, Big Gene. I said, what up, 50? He said, they can't stop what God got planned. Now, with all this new info coming to light, people are starting to question whether Diddy had something to do with the attempt on 50's life. Some believe it could be tied to the fact that 50 was one of the first people to really start calling Diddy out for his shady dealings in the industry. And let's be real, 50 has never been one to back down. He's always been fearless when it comes to putting pressure on Diddy and exposing the things that go on behind the scenes in the music world. 50 himself has acknowledged how lonely it can be to stand up and call out the BS in the industry. He's talked about how no one else seems willing to hold certain people accountable, so he's made it his mission to do so. You're one of the first persons in entertainment to really call out people and kind of have that authority in that to be able to call people out. I don't have a support system of or a peer group of artists that I require to do what I'm doing. I've had to be on my own from the beginning. Despite the dangers and threats, even after the shooting, 50 didn't let it phase him. In fact, it seemed to fuel his fire even more, and he continued to apply pressure on Diddy. However, there's another big name people are linking to the attempted emder of 50 Cent, and that's none other than Jay-Z. Where's the, um, the 50 Jay-Z competition? Mm, that's the one I've been waiting for. Go against Chica, yo, is dense. I'm about a dollar, what the f is 50 cents? It's wild, but fans are digging up the old beef between the two and wondering if Jay had something to do with it. Let's break it down. Back in 1996, when Jay-Z dropped his debut album Reasonable Doubt on June 25th, the world was finally introduced to Jay-Z, the rapper, instead of just Sean Carter, the hustler from Brooklyn. That album marked the beginning of his rise to success, and Jay slowly became a household name. But while Jay was blowing up, there was another guy coming up in the streets of South Jamaica, Queens, who wasn't yet known as 50 Cent. Back then, he went by the name Boo Boo, and he was doing whatever he needed to survive, whether that meant sticking people up or selling drugs. At that time, Jay-Z was making moves in the industry, building key relationships that would help him climb to the top. He got close to big players like Irv Gotti, and eventually built connections with Kenneth Supreme McGriff, a notorious figure in the streets, especially in Queens. Supreme had just finished a five-year prison bid and was released on parole in 1994. As Jay's career progressed, his ties with Irv Gotti, Ja Rule, and the Emder Inc. crew, as well as Supreme, only grew stronger. Meanwhile, Boo Boo was starting to think about music, but no one knew him as 50 Cent just yet. In 1996, 50 started writing rhymes, and by 1997, he caught the attention of Run DMC's Jam Master Jay. Jay saw something in 50 that reminded him of Jay-Z, just a more aggressive version. 50 didn't really know how to structure songs at the time. His raps were more like raw bars with no hooks. So Jam Master Jay signed him to his label and began mentoring him, teaching him the ropes. But things didn't take off as fast as 50 wanted. Jay was busy with other projects, and 50 was left hanging around with nothing happening. Frustrated, 50 asked to be released from the label so he could move on. He ended up signing with the Trackmasters, platinum selling producers who had a deal with Columbia Records. 50 hit the studio hard and recorded 36 songs in just two weeks, which was insane. But again, he found himself stuck, waiting for his music to drop. His debut album, Power of the Dollar, was ready, but it was just sitting on the shelf. By 1999, Jay-Z had already released three albums and was one of the biggest names in rap. He was everywhere, and so were the people he associated with, like Ja Rule, Emder Inc., and Supreme. 
but 50 wasn't about to sit around waiting any longer. He started learning the business side of the music industry while hanging around Columbia Records, learning everything he could about how things worked. And that's when he decided to take matters into his own hands and make himself hot. In April 1999, 50 dropped a track called How to Rob, which took the industry by storm. In the song, 50 hilariously and boldly called out some of the biggest names in hip-hop at the time. People like DMX, Big Pun, Slick Rick, Master P, Diddy, and of course, Jay-Z. Fox in the drop for four blocks, plotting the jokes up for that rock, corrupt cop. What you could just so like four million got something to live for. Don't want to put in full through that Bentley coupe. The track was meant to be more comedic than serious, but it was still a bold move in an industry that was still reeling from the East Coast West Coast beef between Tupac and Biggie. Naturally, a lot of rappers responded to 50, and one of them was Jay-Z. At this point, Jay-Z was at the top of the rap game, and for 50 Cent, this was exactly what he wanted, a big name to mention him, giving him more exposure. A few months later, at Hot 97's annual Summer Jam, both Jay-Z and 50 were in the building. Shaka Zulu, who worked in radio at Columbia at the time, took 50 backstage to meet a few people and show everyone that the How to Rob track was all in fun and wasn't meant to be taken seriously. But when 50 ran into Jay Jay-Z backstage, Jay told him straight up that he was going to get him back for that. I ran into Jay at Summer Jam. And he came up like, yo, I'm 50 Shane, yeah. I said, oh, that's a, that's a, uh, I said, that, that record you got is hot. Yo, I don't like that record you got. I love that record you got. Yeah. I like that joint. He was like, thanks, man. I said, yeah, but I, you know I'm about to go in, right? I'm like, ah, right, you know, do what you do. At the time, 50 didn't think too much of it. He figured Jay would clap back later on a record. But that same night, Jay-Z decided to hit back in real time. During his set, he threw some bars at 50 Cent, and just like that, 50 knew it was officially on between him and Hov. He said, I'm about a dollar. Who the f is 50 Cent? I'm about dollars. Who the f is 50 Cent? <laughs> I didn't even know 30,000 people knew who 50 Cent was. 50 and his team were hyped because now, after Jay-Z mentioned him, all eyes were on 50. Columbia Records finally started pushing 50's music and they released singles like Rowdy Rowdy, Thug Love, and Thar, and Your Life's on the Line. Then on December 28th, 1999, Jay-Z dropped his fourth studio album, Vol 3, Life and Times of S. Carter, and on track six, It's Hot, Jay came for 50 again with a few bars. In 50's eyes, the beef was now official. In early 2000, 50 released a response track called Be a Gentleman, which appeared on his compilation mixtape Guess Who's Back, released in April 2002. But Jay-Z never responded to the track, and this is where things start to get interesting. It was around this same time in 2000 that 50 Cent was shot nine times. One of the big reasons people are tying Jay-Z to 50 Cent's attempted emder is because of his close relationship with Supreme and Ja Rule. Rumor has it that Supreme was the real mastermind behind the hit on 50, and even if Jay-Z didn't pull the trigger himself, it's possible he knew 50 was going to be taken out. The real story behind the attempted emder actually starts with the beef between 50 50 Cent and Ja Rule. According to 50, his friend Troy had robbed Ja. When Ja and 50 later met at a club, 50 wanted to clear the air. But Ja thought 50 was involved in the robbery. Ja later confirmed the robbery happened, but denied ever seeing 50 with the guy who robbed him. But it had nothing to do with him. Like, I didn't even know you know this dude. Supreme stepped in and asked 50 to stop harassing Ja. And since Preemi was someone 50 looked up to, he agreed. But he kept dissing Ja in his song, Your Life's on the Line. Even though he cut out some lines mocking Ja as a studio gangster who needed Prem's help to get his chain back. Out of respect for Prem. Murder, fuck around and leave you murder. I don't believe you. But the beef with Ja Rule didn't really cool down, and Preem was always in Ja's corner, trying to talk 50 Cent into chilling out and stopping the harassment. But 50 wasn't too thrilled that Preme kept siding with Ja. Plus, Preme didn't see 50 as a potential superstar anyway. Why bother changing things up when you're making good money from an established star like Ja Rule? You personally, the Murder Inc., the people that you see like Irv, Ja, the people that are involved in the business aspect are like these don't got no hoodie. Then, things really blew up when Ja and 50 performed at the same club and ended up in a brawl. 50 walked away with Ja Rule's chain, which he even flaunted in the music video for Life's on the Line. Naturally, Ja ran to Preemi again to get his chain back, but this time, 50 managed to get a watch in return. I eat you for breakfast, a watch was a for your necklace, and your boss is a 
Prime was getting fed up with 50 because he was messing up his superstar's image. And this was the second time he had to step in to fix things for Ja. 50 was determined to bring down Emder Inc. And his relationship with Preemie kept getting worse. In an interview with XXL, 50 shared a story about hearing that Ja was filming in the Coliseum area. He decided to pay him a visit packing a pistol and riding a motorbike over there. He ran into Premi, who told him, Hey, come here, don't even do it. I see you. Premi pulled him aside, and 50 was like, Yo, what's up with this dude? Premi just told him to leave Ja alone, saying, Nah, nah, I told you. Leave them alone, man. You know they ain't gonna do nothing. Tony Yeo also shared a story about one of the encounters between Premi and 50 when their relationship was falling apart, where 50 showed Premi that he wasn't scared of him. I remember Premi coming to the block one day, and try to like sun 50 and rub his head. You know what 50 did? Yeah, my Do it back, yeah. yeah and that was the day I know Preem didn't like 50. To make things more intense, 50 started hanging out with E, Moneybags, Big Nose Troy, and Green Eyed Born, all of whom had beef with Preem. Things hit a boiling point when 50 released the track Ghetto Quran, which leaked and got into Prem's hands. In the song, 50 mentioned Preem, and that didn't sit well with him at all. Fed Prince and respect the Prem. Boy, you slow I'm gonna break it down illa. See, Prem was the businessman and Prince was the 50 claimed that other artists had talked about Supreme and his shady past, and Supreme was fine with it, even happy that rappers were mentioning his gang in their songs. But when 50 brought him up, Preem got mad. Other gangsters from New York understood that 50's song was just a tribute, but Preem didn't see it that way. Around this time, someone almost K-worded Supreme at a gas station, and Supreme thought 50 Cent was behind it, so he decided to take out his enemies with 50 being the first on the list. Preem hired Daryl Baum, aka Homo, who used to be Mike Tyson's bodyguard to K-word 50 Cent for a hefty sum. On May 24, 2000, 50 left his grandmother's house with his son inside and his grandmother in the front yard. As he got into the back seat of a car, another car pulled up, and an assailant walked up to the window, firing nine shots from a 9mm pistol. 50 was hit in the hand, arm, hip, both legs, chest, and left cheek, a few inches higher, and he wouldn't have made it. Miraculously, after three weeks in the hospital and multiple surgeries, 50 pulled through. His survival became one of the most legendary stories in rap folklore. Three years later, the track Many Men would reveal Homo as the shooter. But by then, Homo was long dead, not by 50's doing or blessing. And that's why people are saying 50 Cent still beefing with Jay-Z to this day might not be just a coincidence. There could be some deeper history behind it. But anyway, 50 survived the shooting, and that moment completely changed his life and career. After taking nine bullets and living to tell the tale, he became known for his toughness and resilience. That shooting didn't just make headlines, it solidified 50's reputation as someone you couldn't take down easily. 